Well, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Uh, if you're in the U.S., it's uh, primarily your afternoon. It's noon in Seattle. If you're in Europe, it's the evening. And if you're our friends in Australia, it's very, very, very early in the morning. So thank you for joining us. But you, you, you know what tomorrow's news is today. So that's the good news. You already know what happened. Um, with that said, we're going to have a little bit of fun. We're headed to mid-year. It's coming up on June 30th. Uh, look for a blog I'm going to kick out in a couple of days of do you know where your earnings are? Because, folks, it is mid-year, and it's uh, time to put the pedal to the metal. So with that said, a uh, little bit of housekeeping up front. We have um, – uh, the, this is the sixth of our MSP Tech Talk series, so this is pretty cool. And we have taken the spring time to kind of go through a weekly academic curriculum. Today we end with Branding with Carl Palachek. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, we have a couple of events coming up. So we have the um, WPC, now known as Inspire in Washington, D.C., July 9th through the 13th. If you want to peel over to the SMB Nation site, uh, we're having our traditional beer summit on the 9th, okay? So not not sure we're gonna be able to pass healthcare or anything like that. Quite frankly, just the opposite. We're gonna have a little bit of fun in DC. Um, lots of parties that night, so we hope that you'll drop by and hang out with us roughly 8 p.m. And then uh, we're off to Channel Con in Austin, Texas, uh, uh, July 31st through August 3rd. And that's always a big industry event, so we'll look forward to seeing you there. And then before you know it, we're going to be announcing yet the fall series for the MSP Tech Talk, so six classes that will be starting in September. Uh, we're putting some touches on that right now. Hope to have that announced in the next couple of weeks. With uh, Oh, and use the question feature to ask your questions, and I'll ask the questions along the way. I'm with my longtime companion. And, and, and partner in crime in the industry, Carl Palachek. So, Carl, I just saw you up here last week in Seattle, and you went yes. down to Portland. What? Where? Where are you? What are you doing? Uh, what's on your? <laughs> let's do some housekeeping. I mean, what's what's on your travel schedule coming up? That kind of thing. Then we'll jump into it, my friend. Well, first, let me just thank you for the steaks on Father's Day. I appreciate that. <laughs> so did my brother. So I'm actually I'm home for like three weeks and then I'm off to uh, Chicago and Detroit for the big SMB Roadshow. So that'll be fun. And I think we have a full house in Chicago. Well, there you go. Chicago is always a great town, by the way. That always done very well with that. Yeah, and it'll be actually my second trip to Chicago this year. So I'm looking forward to it relaxing and enjoying some time, you know, with some friends before the event. So it'll be great. Cool. And, and Carl, for, where, where can people get information on that roadshow? What's the URL for your MSP SMB roadshow? It's smbroadshow.com. So, and obviously if they follow my blog, I will, I will have no end of uh, <laughs> promotions for it. So, okay. Hey Carl, before we jump right into it, um, the, uh, and, and maybe I'll have you also do a baseline introduction for people that don't know you. But before we do that, I do want to do a shout out to Cynix and Veeam. And we're going to chat a little bit more about those two community sponsors later. But they have been uh, helping us put on this six-part series. Carl, as you know, it, 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 it takes support. Um, I'd like to call them donors, but it takes support <laughs> to, to make the wheels turn and to bring these uh, to bring these offerings to market. So, again, shout out to Cynics and Beam. So, who is Carl Palachek for people that don't know you? And let's talk branding. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, just a super quick introduction to me. If you haven't um, seen my stuff, I've built and sold two managed service businesses in Sacramento, California. And I'm the author of 15 books, including the Managed Services in a Month and the Managed Services Operations Manual. So today I want to talk about a very specific view that I have of branding. And a lot of people think your brand is just your logo, and I want to certainly dispel that myth. So my argument is, quite simply, branding is every single thing you do, and the first piece of this presentation is to convince you that this is true. So let's look at that. 
Here's a couple of examples of car advertising. When you look at Volkswagen, they want you to think of fun and small and cute and right. They, they have a certain image that they want you to have. Volvo, like Harry, you just got rid of one of these, right? And it, but it didn't quite look as bad as the one on the bottom right corner there. But you there know, they're you know. <laughs> they're all about safety, right? That you can trust your family with us. You know, who who's going to talk about safety with a car? Well, Volvo is, right? And so, you know, they have two different views of what they want to bring to you. So their brand is more than their logo. It's all about what they're telling you that you can expect from them. So when you look at, at your business, you have to think about what is your promise, right? There's two different definitions of, of branding. One is that your brand is derived from who you are, who you want to be, and who people perceive you to be. The other one is that branding is, is an expression of the essential truth or value of your organization. So when you think about that, Think about your IT business. What are your essential truths? What are the things where you say, I, I'm making a promise to my clients about something? And I think you, you quickly come to the conclusion, it can't be about, we install software faster than anybody else, or we sell the best Microsoft Word that you've ever seen in your life, right? That It can't be about those kinds of products. It needs to be about a bigger picture. So, so think about that. What is your promise? And I want to talk about a few specific promises that you've probably seen in advertising. If I say to you, you get a clean, comfortable room at the lowest price of any national brand, Motel 6 wants you to think of them. That's the promise that they've made. Okay, so that may or may not be successful as their brand, but it is the promise that they're putting forward. So when you think about your business, your business is not that straightforward, right? You're not, it's not that you only sell one thing. HP can come to you and brag about printers or brag about servers, but when you go to your clients, you have to talk about lots and lots of things. So think about all of the, the processes and procedures in your business. The way that you do billing is part of your brand, the way that you treat your employees and your clients, your dress code, how you, do you sell time in 15 minute increments or six minute increments? Believe it or not, those are part of your brand. And I love this quote from T. Harv Ecker, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. You know, if you show up to a prospect and you are dressed real sloppy and you do a half-baked job and you leave papers all over the place and don't log out of their systems and anybody can walk by and get into their server and you say, well, here, I'll, I'll give you this analysis of your network. They're going to think, man, what a sloppy half-baked job this guy did. And they're probably not going to invite you back, right? So you have processes and procedures. You have a way that you deliver service that you need to think of very holistically. And you, you can't just look at it and say, well, I'm going to do the best at this one thing because it's not one thing that they're going to look at. It's everything. And all the pieces of your business affect what people see as your brand. And that's why when you look at, at companies that are really successful, they actually have documented all of their processes. The, the best example of this, of course, is a successful franchise, something like Subway, where they literally give people instructions on how to cut the bread, how to greet people. You go to Starbucks and they've, they've got a manual on the kind of chatter that they want customers to hear when they're in the store, right? So you need to control as much as you can. And a lot of us think, oh, that's too complicated, but it really isn't. There is a, there's a pretty straightforward way that you can think about how people see everything inside your company. And we're going to come back to this slide in a little while. So what is your Hey, promise? Carl. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did want to catch one thing that you said when you said you go to your clients and have a lot to talk about. I, 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 I'd be remiss if I didn't say don't talk too much. Um, 
a lot of us in this industry use too many words. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that. I I tried to tell an off-color story about my wife and all that, and it uh, I got in trouble. But the point <laughs> is, <laughs> the point is, um, economy of words is always welcome when you meet with a client. <laughs> Well, it's also the case that the way that you meet them and greet them and, and manage that first interaction is part of your brand. It literally yep. is, right? So, yep. and there's a lot of people in this business that are a little bit shy or a little bit, you know, weak on some of those people skills. So you just need to like be aware of that and say, all right, let me, let me architect an interaction that's going to be successful. And that's something you can do if you just think about it. So when you think about your the big promise, this only happens because you start building processes and procedures, right? That there has to literally be a way that you think of this is how we do it. So when you when you look at that, you start building what I call habits of success, right? That <clears throat> this is the way we talk to people. These are the words we use when we interact with the person at the front desk, right? This is how we describe problems. We don't say, oh my gosh, it's all such a mess, right? Clients don't want to hear that. You say, well, we made a few adjustments and we're going to look at it and, and just keep monitoring it and make sure everything's okay. So you have to be intentional about it. If you haven't read the book, The HP Way, I highly recommend that you do so. You've probably at least heard of it. The HP way is literally the, the way that HP describes how they built their culture. And it's something where they looked at internally how they treat each other and externally how they treat their clients and then in the bigger picture how they interact with the world around them. And so they developed these, a set of quote unquote rules that have been revised a little bit, but not dramatically uh, over the last 50 years. They have something called the HP way. And basically, it's, it encompasses how they view the world, how they view their own business, and how they, inter they view all of the interactions with the various people inside and outside their company. And I hope you can read this on your screen, but basically the first point there it's okay that profit is a legitimate objective of your company, right? Let's not pretend that that's not why we're in business. But beyond that, you also need to have a good place to work. You need to have a way of interacting with people and building a culture that is supportive of the bigger picture of your organization as a whole. And I'm gonna talk about you know, a few things that are a little less successful in just a minute. But HP literally set a standard for how people treat each other on the job and how they can move forward as an organization with one eye to that. And when you do something like this, it's, it's not an exercise in, oh, let's just go through this in our head and then we're going to stick it in a file folder and no one will ever see it again. You have to take your mission and your vision and your purpose and put them out where people can actually see them and hold you accountable. It also helps because when you do this publicly, then people can look and say, they will describe your business by saying, oh, those are the guys who are always helping with this community project or with the recycling or whatever it might be. Other people begin to talk about you in the terms that you have crafted. So let's go back to Volkswagen. So for those of you who are not aware, Volkswagen is in the middle of a true public relations disaster. A couple of years ago, they, it was discovered that they had designed a diesel engine that they claimed to be the cleanest engine ever, but in fact, it was highly engineered so that when it detected that a smog test was going on, it switched into a super clean mode and it produced exactly the results that they wanted it to produce. But as soon as the test was over, it went back to being an extremely polluting engine. But they put all of their engineering into <laughs> tricking the test instead of actually reducing pollutants. So hey, Carl? Yeah. 
Yeah, if I, I if you don't mind, I'll, I'll add a little value here on that. That um, so so first of all, Jenny Hallmark over in the radio control room has one of those, the and diesel? she has. She a, a, a Volkswagen, and she right. yeah she has received an offer that was glorious. Um, I don't know if Jenny, if you can come on. I know you're you're busy manning the switchboard, but uh, I'm not sure if Jenny has taken up that offer yet. But she received a very handsome offer, as uh, all owners did. Number two, um, we for some of these reasons we actually went out and bought a VW Golf around Thanksgiving uh, to replace that. In fact, the Volvo that you mentioned that we <laughs> retired. Um, I, I went to VW and, and I know this is a sideline, I'll go quick, but I said, who better to go talk to right now about bargains <laughs> right. than, than, than VW? And, <laughs> and we, you know, we, we got out the door for under 25 grand with a AWD golf. We feel pretty good about that. And, um, the, uh, Carl, at the end of the day, the problem wasn't a, a, a recall due to some kind of, um, you know, that the, the, there was like poor engineering. I told my wife exactly the opposite. The engineering is fantastic, right? right? VW engineering is great. In fact, they over <laughs> Exactly. They took the greatest engineers, auto engineers in the world and used it to trick the system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Please, can, I'll, I'll go back on mute, Carl. I'll put my no, no, that's, back in my that's cage. perfect because it, it makes the point that what have they done? They have broken the promise to their customers. And in fact, think about if you were a salesperson, that they lied to their salespeople. Now, the salesperson didn't know that he was lying to Jenny, right? But the, the, the salespeople lied to their customers. They lied to the dealers. The dealers pay millions of dollars to own a dealership, and they were lied to and selling products that were not at all what they thought. I mean, on down the chain, internally and externally, Volkswagen broke their promises, right? They broke their own brand. And I love this joke, right? This is a thing that people put up on the internet. Meanwhile, at the Volkswagen emissions test center, another pass, right? Uh, and they ended up paying $4.3 billion and having several people on their board be indicted because at some point, somebody consciously made the decision, we are going to break the law. So that is a brand that's very, very broken and they are having to work really hard to recover. Here's another one that I, I don't wish anybody any ill, but United Airlines handed me a great example of bad PR this summer. Just a couple months ago, they beat up and dragged one of their clients off of the airline. They reaccommodated him, right? <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, obviously none of us is going to have something like this happen in our business. On the other hand, you don't control everything. You don't control all of your clients or all of your employees. So you have to put processes and procedures in place to make sure that you are in control of your brand. And I want to offer up a resource that I'd like you to download now. It's in the handouts. And I think it just says like Carl's handout or Palachuk handout. And I want to go through this a little bit with you. And we will certainly take any questions that anybody has if they have them, Harry, while people are downloading that. So this handout is basically on differentiation, which Differentiation are probably the six most important syllables in marketing. You know, the, the, the part about differentiation is that you have to be something that is interesting enough so that prospects will pay attention to you. So this handout is a way for you to look and say, what do you do differently in your company than what your competition does? Do you hire differently? Do you train differently, right? And I would like you to Sincerely go through this and think about what you do differently and maybe take this to your team and have them go through it. And then once you've got a list of things that you do differently, then narrow it down to three things that you do very differently, dramatically different. So when you have a dramatic difference, then you can go to clients and say, 
we really are the best at whatever it is, right? United Airlines used to use the slogan that they're the friendly skies. That will be a very tough sell going forward, right? So I'm, I'm not sure what they do. Because if I were to ask you who's the friendly airline, most of you would probably say either Virgin or Southwest, something like that. You would probably not say United Airlines. So a lot of people get stuck in the IT business thinking, well, how can I be different? We all basically do the same thing. But that's not true at all. You know, as I go along all over the U.S. doing my road show and as Harry goes along doing all the different events that he does, we meet so many people. And, you know, sometimes we meet people that really, truly have a completely different view of how you deliver service. And those people have the right to go to their clients and say, I really am different. My company does this differently, either because of the way that we bundle or the way that we train people or whatever it might be. But you need to think about that. And again, I, I gave homework the last time I presented on this and I'm giving homework again. I really sincerely want you to do this. And if you have questions, I'd be happy if you sent me an email. It's, it's on the, uh, the slide deck. So with that, I want to have you think about that and then I'm going to answer any questions if they if there are any. We're yeah, almost... let me Yeah, Carl, let me expand that and put it on screen too. Hang on. I'm kind of getting uh control paneled. <laughs> the whole the whole world's become a control panel, man. Um Exactly. <clears throat> Let's see, uh, we have uh, a side comment from John Krecki that you're a buddy of Bob Nitrio, SMB guru. Um, folks, what I want you to do is make sure, and please ask, uh, Jenny's also manning the, uh, the question feature, but if you cannot see the handout feature on your control panel, so go to meeting has a control panel, go to webinar has a control panel, one of the options is to indeed select handouts and please let us know if that's not working for you. Um, Carl, please continue and then I'm going to uh, have us take a break in about five minutes at midpoint. Go ahead, Carl. Okay. So the, the thing that you need to do is once you, you do this internally is then literally go to your clients and ask them just just little simple questions. What do you like most about our company? Obviously, what do you like least about our company? And then um, also for those, dig a little deeper and ask them, do you like that enough or do you dislike that enough that it would actually affect your decision to do business with somebody like us? And do a little research. The beautiful thing about asking clients is that they already like you. You know that they like you. But they might like you for reasons different than what you thought. I probably spent 15 years with KP Enterprises telling people, hey, we hire only Microsoft certified and Microsoft trained technicians. And that was a big deal for us. Everybody had at least one uh, MCP certification. And so every single client that we had knew that everybody on my team was Microsoft certified. Now, if I go back and ask them, guess what? It turns out nobody ever hired us because of that. They may have liked it. They, some of them told me that they thought that it affected our recommendations and some of our decisions, but they didn't hire us because of us and they wouldn't fire us because of it. It was just a thing. They were very aware of that. It was part of our branding but it wasn't something that would actually get more business. So if I were to have asked that question 10 years sooner, I might have made different decisions about how to design and, and run my business, right? And so when you think about the new clients, you know, take some of this information into effect and, and think about how will I position our business going forward and make sure that you get that client feedback because if they didn't buy me because of my Microsoft certification, I got to figure out why they did, right? So I had to do research into that and then start focusing on that as a selling point because obviously my brand was a little different than, than what I thought it was going to be. 
So, if there are no questions, uh, I would be okay if we go to the break. We were going to do a video, but I guess we're not now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have uh, Andy Thomas not seeing the handouts. Jenny, could you respond to Andy, please, up on the, uh, the, 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 the questions, see if you can help out Andy individually. And then we have David Anderson uh, responding about, so why did they hire you? And boy, that's, that, well, that's a softball. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a wise uh, acre. So, you know, Carl, it must be because you're so handsome. I mean, well, I if David Anderson, <laughs> if he's going to throw me a softball, I'm going to hit it, man. <laughs> so, let's see here. Uh, so, Okay, and Andy Thomas is replying, never never mind, I found them, so great. Um, yeah, let's move into a, uh, a chit-chat with Brent. Brent, are you there from Cynex? I am here. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. How's no, no problem. Good, good, good. So, uh, Brent, I always like to start off with uh, where where are you today? Where are you located? I'm located in Greenville, South Carolina, which is our sales headquarters. Okay, great. And then I, in the morning news, uh, I was watching. It looked like the reporter had an umbrella up down in Florida. Are are you getting rain over on the East Coast? Is it rainy there today? It is not rainy here today. It's actually pretty sunny. Um, probably mid 80s. Pretty good weather. Okay, cool. We're just trying to burn off the marine layer over here on the West Coast and <laughs> get our our afternoon sunshine. So. Um, Brent, I want to talk about a couple of things. Uh, let's talk about um, what's uh, coming up very shortly, the Microsoft Inspire Conference, formerly known as WPC. Mm -hmm. um, I've been coordinating with your colleague, Jeff Rigsby, and he indicated, and I, I might have gotten it wrong, but he indicated it's like 30 or 40 uh, uh, folks from Cynics are going to Inspire. Maybe, maybe that number also included some of your partners, but it sounds like... Um, my, my understanding is you're going to have a very robust presence in two weeks at that conference. Is that correct? That That is correct. We, we are sending about uh, 35, 40 uh, from our team um, out out to Inspire. I, unfortunately, will not be one of those. But, we, yeah, we are sending a, a pretty good contingent. we got a good booth set up this year. Um, would love to have anybody stop by or, or even set up meetings um, for those of – for those interested in, you know, learning more about what we do and how we can partner together. Well, boy, you better have a double wide booth with uh, <laughs> with that many people. We want to make sure there's room for customers to get on the carpet, my friend. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> any event, um, I don't don't know if uh, you can tackle this one. And and I bring it up again. I brought it up several times over the last six weeks with our academic series here. Again, this is, uh, for those of you joining late, this is the sixth and final installment of MSP Tech Talk. Uh, we will be back this fall, so keep your eyes open. Um, but I uh, want to talk about the Cloud Advisor deadline coming up in two days, June 30th, and people have to shift over to the CSP um, paradigm. Brent, what's, what's the story? It, it's 48 hours away, man. <laughs> Yep. So, you know, as most people know, Advisor is coming to an end. The, you know, the program is still out there, but the fees have come to an end. Um, right now, we're, we have a couple, you know, if, if you were to get an order in in June, we're offering free um, BitTitan Migration Wiz uh, licenses. So if anybody has any migrations to do, or even if you just want to save up those licenses for another time, we're offering... Um, those at a at a free cost at the moment. And those normally retail for about fifteen dollars. So, anyone that has to do a migration, definitely we could we could take care of those folks um, at a much reduced cost. But uh, we'll have a number of different um, incentives and and promotions in the market for for the folks in July, even um, just for for people that are still on advisor looking for a partner to switch. Um, we've got great margins if you're able to handle support for your customer. We're given. 16% um, and upwards of 18% um, off the MSRP. So very competitive margins. Um, I know a lot of people don't like to, you know, do the billing and that comes takes off of your margin. But when you're getting 16 to 18% off the MSRP, there's there's some room for um, there's some wiggle room for billing in there. Um, so we're we're definitely happy to help you through that process. I, I myself can walk you through that process, what it looks like. It's a very seamless transition. There's no data loss. There's no downtime. From an in-customer perspective, 
the only difference is they're going to get billed by you instead of getting billed by Microsoft, and uh, that's that's really about it. So from an end customer perspective, really shouldn't be much of a change at all. But we're we're happy to help you, you know, every step of the way through that process. Yeah, well, and, and again, I appreciate it. And folks, I realize many of you have been on all six lectures, and now you've heard this lecture four times, but. You know, they, they, they say six touches to learn, so we're almost there. And, 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 and the reason I say that, Brent, is, um, you know, my experience with the XP migration deadline, my experience with the server 03 deadline is uh, people don't respond, you know, in, 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 until there's either pain or gain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that could very well be after the June 30th deadline, I, I predict. I predict it's going to be a really robust conversation in uh, calendar Q3. Um, Carl, we'll, we'll definitely want to talk about this in our uh, analyst report coming up in mid-July. <clears throat> so let's make a note to uh, ma make a note to cover off on that. But Brent, thanks a lot and uh, appreciate your support. Cynix has been a supporter for the entire series. Totally appreciate it to make this happen. We're going to get right back to Carl. Again, if you join late, a little bit of housekeeping. This is the branding conversation. It's uh, installment number six of a six-part series called MSP Tech Talk coming back to you this fall. Immediately ahead, we're having the infamous SMB Nation Beer Summit on July 9th in Washington, D.C., a Sunday night at 8 p.m. So go to smbnation.com and poke around to find up and sign up, find it and sign up for that. And then uh, later on Channel Con in Austin in early August. Carl, are you still there, my friend? Let's get rocking. All righty. Thank you very much. So we will get to the question of why people did hire us in the in in the end. So, but we're we're going to work at work towards it here just a little bit. So the second part is about thinking about branding from this per perspective of who you serve. And I really want to emphasize the word serve because this is a service business. So if you're in it to be grubby and greedy and take, well, you're going to earn some money, but you're not going to earn very many friends, which means when times get tough, you're going to have a tougher time earning money. But if you put the emphasis on serving a clientele, then it becomes something like, okay, what can I give to them that they can't get somewhere else? What can I give to them that they need that I am uniquely qualified to give? And that's where you begin to look at your brand being intertwined with the people that you are serving. Again, another great promise, FedEx, right? When it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. Right? That That is a statement that literally catapulted that, that company into prominence because it was super clear exactly. Like when you have no choice but to get it there tomorrow, you have no choice but to send it by FedEx, right? So what do you do and for whom do you do it? So think about with your own company, what is it that you do? And again, the answer can't be, oh, we install software and we sell servers and we, we configure firewalls. Yeah, th those are specific items, but big picture. And today with this, this latest ransomware outbreak, great example. What do you do? You provide security. You protect people's businesses when stuff hits the fan, right? It's a, this is not just about, oh, uh, we'll make sure your antivirus is up to date. No, we'll make sure that your company is in business when there are pictures of thousands of people down and out because they clicked on a virus and they had the wrong systems. They had the wrong IT service provider protecting them, right? So you're going to get them back in business or you're going to keep them from going out of business in the first place, right? So think in those grand terms of, of what you do. Another great promise is from Ritz-Carlton. They describe themselves as ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. So if you go to Ritz-Carlton and you look at the, the about page, they literally just describe themselves in those terms. The, their help are not grubby people running around trying to take your money and putting their hand out all the time. They want you to think of the, 
their help as ladies and gentlemen who just happen to be on the other side of the counter. So there's a, a very strong promise there that is going to be a high level engagement. This isn't the, the, the clerk at the, the cheap hotel with his thumb in a novel feeling like you're interrupting him so that you can check in, right? That's not what you're gonna get at the Ritz Carlton, right? And again, the emphasis is on service. So with my own company, Small Biz Thoughts, if, if you were to meet me at a barbecue and ask me what I do for a living, I would tell you I help technology consultants to be better at the business side of their business. So to that end, I write books, I do trainings, I give speeches, right? I do lots of different things. We put on classes, we do all kinds of things, but it's all around this kind of bigger picture of helping IT consultants on the business side. And we do some technical training, but for the most part, you know, you can get all the technical training about Microsoft products for absolutely free at Microsoft.com, right? There's millions and millions of pages about how to get the technical side of things figured out. But there's not that much available for figuring out, well, how do I make sure that I have the right chart of accounts and how do I, how do I hire the right people and questions like that. So whether I'm successful or not is up to you, but the, the goal for me is to help IT consultants on, with business processes. So that's my, you know, the current company, Small Biz Thoughts. So, so Carl, a couple of thoughts here that uh, maybe add value, maybe detract value, but I always <laughs> like to say, um, you know, I, I, I spend some time in the private sector in addition to uh, owning and, and, and helping uh, run SMB Nation. And, um, I, I figure I'm the world's worst interviewer, okay, because I, in many ways, haven't had a job in over 20 years. And <laughs> I, I, I look at people from Microsoft, man, they got it down. They know how to interview. They come in, they got the 30, 60, 90 day plan. They're ready for the questions about, you know, what were the top two or three problems you had in your career and how did you solve them? <laughs> you know, and Carl, there are just people that know how to interview. They really do. And right. um, as entrepreneurs and small business owners and MSPs, you know, essentially our sales function is a job interview. Um, what I've tried to do in terms of crystallizing my statement down to uh, a sentence is, is, is you've done. And again, I'm not sure it's a great example, but I like to use you know, and, and, and I think it, it's reflective that in my career, for whatever reason, um, you know, I've just, I've, I've always kind of been where the puck's going, right? I just, you know, the small business server thing, the, right. the this, the that. I, I you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a walk-on on an NFL team. I wasn't a draft pick. And, you know, I'm the Steve, the, the Steve Largen of the SMB community, right? <laughs> But, you know, I, I, that's how I try to crystallize it. I don't know that it's a great way to say it, but I, I do feel that I've, I've just had the ability to kind of, you know, be there with the original Apple II Plus, be there with SBS, right? I, I, I fancy myself as trying to kind of be there where the puck is going, if, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, again, it, it, anything that lets people, like, continue that conversation, Right. That, oh, that's so what follows from that and what's next? And obviously it begins a dialogue. You know, people always talk about, oh, you should have a 30 second elevator speech. No, you shouldn't. You absolutely should not. You, you should never give speeches in elevators. You know, what, when people ask you a question, you should have a one sentence answer that gives them enough information so that they think they understand what you do. And then if they want to follow up, they can. And if they'd rather just reach across and get another hot dog, they can do that as well, right? That just, you know, it is, you're not going to be at the, at the cocktail party signing contracts. You just want to start a conversation, right? So in terms of KP Enterprises, so my first uh, IT consulting business, what we settled on was we help our clients differentiate themselves from their competition through technology. Clearly, we're a technology company in, I think it was 2003, but it might have been 2004. I incorporated as KP Enterprises Business Consulting Incorporated. So when I went from a sole proprietorship 
to a corporation, I put business consulting in there because what I learned from my clients is they didn't care. It's not that they didn't care. They wouldn't hire me based on the fact that we were Microsoft certified, but they would hire me if they thought that they could improve their business. And so the, the promises that we made were that we're going to focus on the business. So we literally help our clients make more money through technology. And a really great example, one of our bigger clients was a, actually not that big in terms of numbers, just in terms of money, was a medical office in the Bay Area. They had five heart surgeons. They had five line of business applications. And one of the things they did is we helped them build and maintain a site so that they could have two doctors in different cities looking at the exact same really like massively complex heart videos and get a consult across 400 miles of space, right? These two guys are going to be able to look at the same thing and get an analysis and come to a conclusion about what the treatment needs to be. There literally isn't another doctor in Northern California that can do this. And that doctor knows that that technology makes him a bunch of money. And that's how he can afford to have four other heart surgeons on staff. So as you can imagine, their expense for downtime is unacceptably high. What does that mean? It means they will spend any amount of money to stay in business. So when we go to them and say, you need four more access points for your tiny little office with 14 employees, they buy them because they don't question that we are interested in keeping them on the cutting edge. You know, you may recall, Harry, one of the questions on the, the marketing piece of the small business specialist exam was about, you know, how do we identify clients who are technology dependent, right? If, if somebody doesn't care about technology, they're not really gonna be a great client. If somebody lives and dies by technology, that literally was, that was the target for KP Enterprises. We wanted somebody who could not tolerate downtime. So I'm happy to take all those people who buy $400 a year in break fix, you can, you can take them. <laughs> Any IT provider who wants it can take those clients off my hands and I will be happy to let them go because I wanna focus on the people who absolutely require that they have good solid technology and are willing to pay for it. Yeah, yeah, and Carl, I'll, I'll add a quick comment um, that uh, a, a company I'm assisting right now in the Seattle area, uh, they told me early, they told me once, they told me twice. Of course, my ears weren't open. You know, I had to hear it myself about six times, but they said with the nature of the work we're in in technology, <clears throat> talk to companies over $200 million in revenue. And I said, boy, that's a... That, that that's a real paradigm shift for me, <laughs> <laughs> and a much smaller pool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, but you know, uh, they're great people. I've I've been lending them a hand, and um, I get it. I I I I get it. You know, they uh, they're, they're making money. I mean, I'll just leave. You know, I can go on for hours, but they're making money. I get it. And you know, I Carl, I learn every single day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, it's, you know, and it is hard to have somebody hire you if they don't have enough money to, to provide the, you know, to, to be able to have spare money for an IT consultant, you know, better to have people who've already got a budget, right? And anyway, so, so that was a piece of it. Also, I personally, I have a very strong personal belief that I'm only going to do business with people that I like. And so I don't hire people I don't like. I don't have vendors I don't like. I don't deal with clients I don't like. So that makes a difference. And it also allowed me to differentiate myself by saying, look, we are going to be friendly and trustworthy. And so that's a big piece that people like. They like the fact that we talked people talk and we talked business talk and not just speeds and feeds and, and technology. So... So that's how KP Enterprises position themselves. 
Again, another great book. If you haven't read it or listened to the Audible version of this, truly spectacular book, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So why are you in this business? You know, when you, when you answer that question, it, you must begin with the words, we are passionate about. What are you passionate about? And if the answer is nothing, it may explain why you may be having some trouble describing what you do to your clients and figuring out what your branding is. If you're not passionate about anything, you may be in the wrong business. So find what you're passionate about. I'm passionate about helping people. It, it breaks my heart to see people who've been in IT for 30 years and they have no retirement and no savings in the bank. Like literally, I, I want that problem to cease to exist in our business, but it's everywhere. So for me, that is something I'm passionate about. I think that there's a right way to do technology and I'm passionate about that. So, you know, that, that's where my passion comes from. But, you know, when you look at your clients, what's your passion? And to be honest, when it comes to like IT service delivery, I'm absolutely passionate about patches, fixes, updates, and backups. Like for me, I, I firmly believe testing backups is the single most important thing that we do at our clients. And no one in who ever had me as their IT provider ever had to worry about their backup because it is the one thing I put higher priority than anything else. I will test a backup before I will fix the boss's laptop, period, because it is more important. And I will explain that to the boss, but I will test that backup on a regular basis. So that was something that they never had to worry about because that's where my passion was. And I was really clear about that in my newsletters and in my communications with them. So there was no lack of clarity. <laughs> Couple of thoughts, Carl. Speaking of backups, um, if if you don't mind, that just made me think of something. But we actually have a double dip this week, and we have a webinar tomorrow um, on disaster recovery. So, Jenny, if you could make a note uh, to to have the people that have attended today, if you could kick out a quick note to them, maybe put it up in the chat and in the follow up email. But a link if you would like to attend a more technical conversation on backup and disaster recovery. This is double dip week. We're fitting it all in before mid-year, end of quarter. <laughs> <laughs> and Carl, um, on the passion front, uh, what I wanted to talk to you about is, you know, you and I have, have you know, both owned, started, owned, and operated uh, uh, businesses and hired and fired. And I, it, 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 it just, it's so sad when um, I have someone who's not a great fit in my organization you know, they're, they're not bad people. They're either in the wrong seat of the bus or the wrong industry. But, boy, I, I land with both feet when uh, we and, – and this has happened, but we, we did a customer wrong. And I'm not saying, you know, a huge mistake, but, but maybe something wasn't quite spelled out in the statement of work. And, you know, we're going to do the right thing. But, mm -hmm. you know, when we do a customer wrong, you can really learn – where people's passions are because there's there's two kind of people there's the people that are going to get in the car and go over to the customer site and proactively take care of it or I've uh, hired and and fired people who say well you know that's all the customer gets that's all they get right <laughs> yeah they signed a deal they're done <laughs> yeah and I'm like, well, today's your left. But go ahead. You know where I'm going with this. So what, what, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Because it's a reflection well, I, of passion. What's funny is I want to bring it all the way around. You're not even going to believe what I'm going to bring in here. So Beatrice Mulzer and I were on a, a, a podcast literally 10 years ago. There was some big storm coming through Florida like shortly after she moved there. And she was literally driving from client to client, picking up their servers and driving north so that she could plug them in outside of the storm zone, right? <laughs> that is passion you can't pay for, right? Right. So right. now today you'd put them in the cloud, so it's a totally different discussion. But, you know, 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and, and, you know, truth in marketing, like my passion I, I is completely disconnected from the, the uh, fact that Veeam is one of the sponsors of this. I get no money from Veeam, you know, that's – 
that's that's not a piece of that. So just so you know. Um, so think about what is your why? Why are you doing this? Why are you in this business? Right? And we're all, I mean, most of us anyway, almost all of us are complete nerds. We love technology. We love playing with stuff. We like opening the box and we like seeing what the new cards are and and you know all of that. Trying the different switches, right? That's what we do. And that really adds to the fact that we enjoy our jobs. We enjoy doing what we do, and that needs to be visible to the clients. So figure out why you do what you do, figure out what it is that you do, and, and figure out how does that fit with your clientele. And I really encourage you to not think about the size of businesses as your focus, right? Notice, notice the one person, two person, 11, 50 desktops. Those are not verticals. Those are horizontals, right? There's only one vertical, as Bob Farkas says, that's also a horizontal, and that is he's in the funeral industry, right? So it's both a vertical and a horizontal. Everybody else, if you have a, a vertical, you learn to speak their language. One of my verticals was always non-for-profits, right? So a non-profit has a certain way that they talk. They talk about their board, they talk about their mission statement, they talk about the software they use and memberships and all this sort of thing. Once you begin to learn their language, you can become somewhat of an insider. If you don't know their language, especially you know accountants or homeowners associations or whatever, if you don't know their language, they will know it in one second that you don't, you're, you don't know what they do. And that's cool. You can provide competent tech support to anybody, but you can provide spectacular tech support when you know the brands that they know and you know the vendors they know and you know the challenges of their industry and what other people are doing to be successful and which products they use and what are the alternatives in the cloud, right? Once you begin to focus on a vertical, then it, it actually can help drive your passion and your interaction with your clients to a new level. So think about your branding in terms of having a couple of verticals. And you don't have to get rid of all of your clients, but just think about what are one or two verticals that I could get into that will help me focus what we do as a business. So, are there any other questions? I hope I've answered the question about like wh why people actually hired me. Yeah, a uh, couple, couple questions. Uh, Devel asks, uh, what do you think of moving from the four P's to the four C's of marketing? Um, goes on to say, with the, the, the letter C, goes on to say customer needs, cost, channel, and communications. The P's are company centric. The C's are customer centric. What do you think about that, Carl? Well, I mean, I think any way that you want to slice and dice the world makes sense. I mean, the the the. I guess for me, I'm more interested in the communications and the 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 customer focus than anything else. But I mean, obviously. The, the big the big P of all the, <laughs> the four P's is profit, right? So, um, you know, any way that you slice and dice it makes sense. I think that you need to have a holistic view of your business and your culture, you know, that we had at KP Enterprises, we always had a culture that there is a right way of doing things. And I, that's, it's huge in, you know, how far that goes to help train consultants and help them understand why we do some of the things we do. One of the things that I really love about Simon Sinek's book, which is more of a four C's kind of book, is that um, when everybody in the company understands why their position exists and why we do things a certain way, they can help support each other. And a great example is, is have a technician take over as the service coordinator for a day. And they will understand exactly why all work has to be done on a ticket, why you have to have a good title on the ticket and a good description. You have to work in real time, right? There's all of these lessons you learn because now all of a sudden you realize somebody every day is hurting cats and their job is not easy, 
right? So, so you make a technician sit in that job for a day and all of a sudden they have a much higher respect for what a service coordinator has to go through. So I'm not sure if that well, directly it, answers that question, but. Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to add some value here, uh, hopefully, is that um, I was talking to my 87-year-old mom who's in a retirement place on Lower Queen Anne in Seattle by the Space Needle, and God bless her. And and I was trying to explain, Carl, as you know, at the time I was helping a big data startup um, on Lower Queen Anne for two years. And so I tried to explain to mom, you know, what is big data, what is predictive analytics, and, and so I came up with and I'll weave this into this conversation. I, I finally had to say, Mom, I'm actually I'm part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and and here's what I mean. And and to this day, I still struggle with analytics from uh, the way that we grew up in SMB. With uh, you know, these are my fishing buddies. These are my friends. I live on an island. I, you know, I, I love the relationships of business and. Um, analytics is sort of the antithesis of that. However, um, I'm getting more comfortable with that uh, because I think, you know, the, it, it, again, it's not for today, but I think at the end of the day, data is our friend and data driven decisions can be good decisions. But, um, Carl, I think I've, I've had this talk with you where I, I kind of referred more to the five P's of marketing. Um, under Porter and and that I think you can throw a lot of that out the door and, and think in terms of predictive analytics like marketing 2.0 is now analytics and marketing 1.0 is the five P's uh, again taking a left turn on on the nature of this question but um, it's out there in fact uh, Jenny and I were just talking that we're gonna bring back that lecture we're gonna update and bring that lecture back for fall quarter um, with the six-part series so Carl, uh, you know what, Carl? I think I'm at the yep. I'm at the I'm, top of the hour, Carl. Let I'm, me do a little I'm bit here. of housekeeping. Isn't um, it awesome that I put together this thing for the video and then video doesn't uh, doesn't work today on the go to webinar? There you go. <laughs> there, the worldwide outage. Darn, <laughs> darn worldwide things. Um, so, I want to talk to you about Veeam. Uh, Veeam has uh, raised their hand and said, yes, we want to participate in the SMB community. And it's pretty interesting because to some extent, this is a newer conversation uh, for Veeam. Veeam is a surprisingly large company. They have a surprisingly large partner ecosystem. Carl, about a month ago, they had a partner conference with 5,000 people. And I'm like, you know, boy, howdy. That's wow. Uh, that, yeah, that's that's a real conference, and Veeam has grown uh, their reputation primarily in the mid market and the enterprise space, and now they've raised their hand and said we want to have an availability conversation, so high availability, and we want to bring that down into the SMB space, and we'd like to you know join SMB Nation. We'd like to have that conversation with your community, um, getting feedback um, along the way. So. For that reason alone, uh, I, I, I appreciate that. And, and guys, I would say give them a fair shake. Um, we're going to give you some resources on Veeam in the follow-up email. But you know, those that that you support, that support us, make all of this happen and allow us to have academic conversations online. So um, an honor about a Veeam, Carl. Let's uh, let's go into the, uh, the 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 last portion. The home stretch. All righty. So, part three. So we get we have sort of, you know, the the big picture. Branding is everything. Branding is is related to your clientele. Well, branding is also how you do what you do, and this gets into processes and procedures. So, you know, that we get the the why you do it and what you do, who you do it with, and then how. And when you think about this, part of this depends on what your promise is. But given that, there's still a standard way that you do things. And one of the things I talk about, for example, I have a blog post from many years ago about the first engagement. I love the first job that I do in a new client to be completely controlled. So for example, we're gonna go in and tune up all the workstations. So that allows me to go in, meet and greet at the front office, talk to everybody, in the entire client office, sit at their desktops, they will see that I'm respectful, that we're clean, that we're organized, we have a checklist, 
We're going to clean up every machine, which is something that we completely can control, right? There's no big mysteries there. We're not fixing major problems. We are taking notes. We're creating service tickets. We're going to make sure there's no, you know, no virus problems. We are going to put in all the patches, fixes, and updates, install our remote agent, and then, right, when we're done, we'll have greater control of their environment. We will never stand up from a machine without making sure that we can get to the server, get to the internet, print, and send and receive email, right? Once we do that, now we've got, we've touched every machine, we've defined exactly what we want to do, we've done it successfully, we've charged the client exactly what we told them we were going to charge them, right? So that's a successful first engagement in which we control everything. What we don't do is walk in and say, I'm the IT guy, I'm here, what do you need? And then we've opened Pandora's box and they throw all kinds of crap into it. <laughs> and then we run around for an unknown amount of time, not even knowing whether we're going to be profitable or going to be able to, to charge for what we're doing. So the difference between those is quite dramatic. And I lean very heavily towards controlling that first engagement. It sets a tone for everybody. It sets a tone for the relationship. It even sets a tone for the financial piece of that relationship. So the client now sees this is the way that we do business. And again, I want them to have a, a heavy focus on that trust component. Well, Carl, it's, it's, it's been many, many, many years since I've went out on a first date. <laughs> <laughs> Your wife will be glad but, to hear that. <laughs> yeah, but, but, sir, your advice is, is well taken. <laughs> Please continue. So, so this, if, if you go to SOPFriday.com, you'll see this little graphic here. This is my block diagram of how you do the hokey pokey. And the point is, if you can do it, you can document it, right? So whatever you're doing, you do have processes and procedures already. So you're doing something and you're successful enough to be able to take off an hour and a half to watch this webinar so you know you're doing something right but you could probably be better if you had a an organized systematic set of processes to move you forward right so first of all accept that you have a process there is a your way right it may not be the HP way or the KP Enterprises way but you have your way of doing things you need to document that. You need to write it down. And it doesn't have to be long or complicated. You can literally write one or two paragraphs. Just put, start something. You cannot edit a blank page. So open up Microsoft Word, give it a name that makes sense, whether it is invoicing from the PSA or connecting the PSA to QuickBooks or invoicing clients for project labor, whatever it might be. Give it a good solid name and put a few notes in there and then you can always edit it again and again and again until it becomes a true process. My brother likes to talk about how when he first came to work for me many, many years ago, my checklist for doing a migration was pretty meager because so much of it was in our heads, right? But over time, as we hired people, we need to be able to make sure that they did it exactly the way that we did it. Well, that requires more and more complicated checklists until finally we end up with the second half of the network migra migration workbook was a 210 page checklist, right? I mean, it literally was the perfect checklist for the technology that existed at the time. And that is standardization. That allows me to hire anybody on this call to help me with a migration. And because they have enough technical knowledge to be in the room, I guarantee it will be standardized, it will be done our way, and it will be done right, and it will be successful. So you literally begin to, to document your success, and once you do that, the last item on every checklist is update the checklist. So the checklists get better and better and better over time. And again, none of this happens by accident. It, it will never happen by itself. You have to have intention to document your processes, to create it as part of your brand. We really had a very strong brand towards the end of the SBS era. 
that we will document from one set of hardware to another every process in your entire company with zero company-wide downtime. That was a huge selling point for us. It required us to be very, very precise with what we did and the way we did it and lots and lots of planning, but we know that it can be done and we replicated that success again and again. A couple of thoughts, Carl, um, on this is, is what I would add or my own experience is, is a, a lot of this um, skill set doesn't live inside of me. And so I've hired uh, around my weaknesses in, in, in this area. Um, you know, my original employee, uh, well-known uh, actor in the, in, in, in the channel, Nancy Williams, um, she called herself the CE no. <laughs> and I was the CEO because I'd say yes to anybody and she'd have to come in and kind of document stuff and clean it up. But, but a, a, a better example is our own uh, Jennifer Hallmark here in the, uh, the radio control room today who is uh, a, a very detail-oriented person. So I just wanted to uh, throw that out, Carl, that um, you can hire around. <laughs> Absolutely, Your weaknesses to make some of this stuff work for you, man. <laughs> it's true, and you know when you grow, obviously part of part of the way that you grow is that you hire lots of people to help you out. But you know they need to be able to go forth and do it your way, not just a way. And there, yeah. I know there are successful companies. Some of my best friends own companies where they hire good people and let them do, you know, whatever it takes to be successful, and that's all fine. But they're not building a brand where clients know for a fact that it's all going to be done the same way. And Fair I think enough. there's great value in that. So the thing about having these good habits, habits of documentation, habits of standardization and so forth, is that the more you do things the same way again and again and again, the less actual brain power you have to use. There's a growing body of scientific knowledge that long-term behaviors get literally written as a blob of instructions at the base of uh, the amygdala in your brain. And they are executed as a group of instructions, which is why, for example, when you move to a new house, for the first three days, you start driving to the old house until you realize, oh, I don't live there anymore, <laughs> right? It's literally, you're, you've, you've said, I'm driving home, click, and a set of instructions goes into place. The same thing can happen in your business, that, that literally when we sit down, this is how we greet a new client. This is how we set up the accounts. This is how we set up their mailing lists. This is how we invoice them, right? Tick, 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 tick. This is how we do everything that we do. And it becomes a habit that just gets executed instead of something you think about all the time. And that's why I refer to these as the muscles of success. Your, your brain is a muscle that needs to be trained just like anything else. And when you don't work out for a while and you get sloppy and you get lazy, well, it gets out of shape, right? And, and it's not as good at following the processes and procedures as it should be. So what we want to do is to document as much as we can and not overwhelm ourselves, right? What, what you don't want to do is to be completely overloaded right? Because there are hundreds and hundreds of SOPs. I have now on my YouTube channel over a hundred SOP videos and at SOP Friday, which we mentioned earlier, there are I think 300 SOPs there, right? So there's no shortage of SOPs, but you literally can't implement them this afternoon. You couldn't if you wanted to. So you got to figure out how do I do this? And my recommendation is to look at all of the things that you want to improve and literally write them down. Put a ticket in your PSA that says, you know, document this process, document that process. Put it, create a, a ticket for every one of them and then prioritize them from high to low. Pick one, one thing. Write out your process and what you want your company to do and implement it next week. Talk to your employees, talk to your clients if you need to, make sure technicians understand, make sure the front office understands, right? And then next week, pick another one and just keep going like that. And eventually you'll do, it, it'll take you years, but that's okay. It took you years to get where you are, 
remember you do have a process you just don't have it necessarily as organized and standardized as you would like it to be so there are many many lists if you just go to like the SOP Friday and just look at the, the the list of all of the SOPs that are available you can just print that out and start <laughs> prioritizing those and you don't even have to read about them just just start thinking about it from time to time and then eventually you'll work on it remember you get better at whatever you put your attention on so if you start putting your attention on your standard operating procedures you will get better at that so this is the repeats uh, well I, I call it Carl um... To, to some extent, uh, that's to, a little bit different spin on that, but to some extent, that's what we call machine learning, right? Um, because as you do more of it, you learn from your mistakes. <laughs> right. Well, that's true. You, you put attention on it, and the way I described it to my mom is just just look at a dog, look at an animal, you know, their instinct, right? They, they just, they, they know not to walk through a fireplace or a fire. <laughs> Exactly. Machine learning. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Carl. This is good stuff. That's all right. So um, anyway, so just remember that, you know, when we think about your brand, right, the way that you do things and, and that whole vision that the way that a client looks at you doing certain things is going to give them faith about all those other things. So if you go in and you say, well, we have a process for this, that, and the other thing, Clients actually respect that. You know, one of the things that people in this business do too much of is taking technical advice from their clients. Your clients hired you to be the pro. So put a tattoo on your arm that says, we like to see. People love it when you tell them what you like. When you say, well, we like to see passwords changed every 30 days. And then, okay, we can get an argument about that if you want, Mr. Business Owner, but let me just check the news and see how we're doing with that worldwide ransomware. We like to see passwords changed every 30 days. We like to see the firewall updated once a quarter, and we'd like to see the firewall configuration backed up. We like to see, you know, click, click, click. And you, when you speak in those terms, kind of the, the royal we, it's clear to the client that you have a way that you deliver services. It literally becomes part of your brand that you have the confidence in what you do. I one time got a couple of quotes for some electrical work at my house and I blogged about this a couple years ago, but the first one was $800. And this guy, he, he knew the electrical box was full, but he was gonna quote unquote, make it work. And he was gonna add two 30 amp circuits and then a 50 amp circuit for my hot tub and he was just going to make it work with the existing box, even though it was full, for 800 bucks. The next quote was $8,000. It was $7,200 more because this guy said, well, we have to replace that electrical box because it's full. And you want to make sure that you do all the grounding properly. And we're going to replace that mask that comes from the utility company because you're adding that extra 50 amp circuit. Click, 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 click. Now. Obviously, we talked him down from there, but the point is that second technician didn't recommend doing anything the wrong way. I had complete faith that they were only going to recommend doing it the right way, and that has huge value for me, right? I believe there was a right way and a wrong way to do these things, so I was totally okay saying, look, I'm going to talk you down. I'm going to beat you up on the price a little bit, but at the end of the day, I hired that much more expensive technician. And I I think we ended up paying like 6,500, but it was still a ton of money, right? It was still way more than the $800. So my, I guess my conclusion would be, don't be the $800 technician. Be the $7,200 technician or the $8,000 technician. Because if you just say, we're only gonna propose doing it the right way, you can always get talked down from there, but you're never gonna talk yourself up to 8,000 from 800, right? So have a way that you do these things. And if you have a specialty, if you specialize in signage or printer maintenance or whatever, security, if you have a certain thing that you really specialize in, start there. 
because that'll be the easiest thing for you to document. It'll be the thing you do most frequently, and it'll be something where you can literally write out, these are our standards of excellence, and it's because we are passionate about security, right, or whatever it happens to be. So when you think in those terms, you begin to put an emotional spin onto it, and clients really enjoy that. They love it. They were like, man, I really did buy the into the right IT service provider. Love this quote, habit is a cable. We weave a thread of it each day and at last we cannot break it. This is so very true. When you start implementing the habits of success, the habits of actually doing things your specific way, it just becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. There's a point at which it affects the chatter in your office. You will hear technicians say to each other, did you document that? Are your notes in the ticket. Did you put the license keys on that, the only drive where we ever put that stuff, right? They, they will begin to talk to each other in those terms and ask those questions. So it doesn't always have to be the service manager, you know, nagging like the mother hen, right? The technicians will encourage each other and build that culture all by themselves. So, <clears throat> Let me just give you a couple tips about implementing processes and procedures. The biggest thing that you have to avoid is saying, well, it's faster the older way. It's always going to be faster the old way until it's faster the new way. That's just the way the world works. We've seen it with every technology. You know, it's faster to handwrite a note than it is to type it on a typewriter until you learn how to typewriter, right? And then it's faster to use the typewriter than it is to use the computer until you learn to use the computer right, on and on and on. It's always easier and faster the old way, but you just need to slow down and take your time, and then the new way will take over, and it really will be better, and you just have to have faith. Many people come to me for coaching, and they're like, well, I know I have to do this, but I just don't have time. I don't have time to implement these processes. And the analogy I like to use is, I'm too busy mopping the floor to fix the roof, right? So... <laughs> So don't be in that position. You know, take some time to actually dedicate to creating processes and procedures. Another big pitfall is that people have procedures. They will tell me, I have procedures. We just haven't implemented them. And I'm confused about what that means, right? So one time I had a coaching client where I, I asked this one guy who was in charge of the whole documentation process, what is your process? And he said every day or every week, the four managers each give me one standard operating procedure draft. I look at it, I make a few notes, I give it back to them, they refresh it, and, and now we have the final version, and then I put that in the binder. And I said, okay, and then what happens? And he said, well, then the next week, each of them gives me a new SOP, and I give them feedback, and I say, no, 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 what, what happened to the first four? He said, oh, they're in the binder. I said, I understand that, but what happens after they're in the binder? Well, we just, every week we get four more and we put them in the binder. And I'm like, wait a minute, are you telling me at no point do you actually tell your employees about these standard operating procedures? And he said, no, we don't want to confuse everybody by constantly changing stuff, so we're just going to wait until we're done. But as we already saw, what's that going to do? That's going to completely overwhelm people. So it's much better to put SOPs into place one at a time isolated from each other so that each of them can be learned and reinforced again and again and again, and then you add another and another. People can learn things one at a time. You can't learn 600 new things at once. It's not humanly possible, but you can learn one thing, and then you can learn another and then another. The other weakness is that things are not implemented consistently, and that would be, for example, when people say, well, I'm going to make sure that all of the technicians put their time in in real time and they have to you know, allocate 40 hours a week. Managers, not so much. Managers just need to put in billable time. Well, okay, that's a problem because you don't know how much time is in the system accurately until all of the time is in the system. And you can't say, well, we're, we're documenting 80% of our time. How do you know that? Until you document 100% of your time, you don't know how much time you're implementing or what percentage you're implementing. So you have to make sure that it's consistent. And we all know the rule of, of 
who gets excluded from the rules at your clients? The owner. Well, that you can't do that in your company. You, the owner, the manager, the people on this call, you can't exclude yourself from policies and procedures. Once it's implemented in your company, you have to follow the rules the same as everybody else. Otherwise, they're just going to look and see, ah, well, he doesn't have to do it, so it can't be that important because he owns the company. So if he's not doing it, certainly I don't have to do it, right? So you have to be really careful about stuff like that. Bottom line is nothing happens by itself. You're not going to wake up tomorrow and have all of your processes documented and in place. You're not going to have everybody doing all of the things that they need to do. You're not going to be allocating all of your time. You're not going to be in control of your brand. You have to take control of your brand. You have to build it with intention and then move forward both internally and externally to make that truly be your company. These are just the list of the books that I have. I assume that you'll be able to go through these, this slide deck again in case you need to. And with that, I will take whatever questions are waiting for us. All righty. Let me go back to that question block. Hold on. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Uh, can we get the slides? Uh, we have the recording. So we'll we'll uh, send out the link for the recording. Carl, it's okay to send out the slides as well? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I'd prefer you okay. send them out in a PDF format, but, you know, that's just me. So. Yeah, yeah, no, Jenny can coordinate with you on that. And then uh, where is uh, SOP Friday? So, boy, that sounds like – Carl, it's... where's the Friday Afternoon Club being held this week? This is <laughs> your – your apartment or mine? <laughs> S SOP Friday is SOPFriday.com. Okay. So hey, that's just go to, yeah. Or you know what? In this new world, Carl, it could have been SOP.Friday. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's, it's all upside down. Um, Carl, those are the questions we have. Folks, while you're still thinking of questions to ask, uh, uh, David, we'll get to this in a moment. Let me finish my David Anderson as a, a point. Um, but uh, if you want to join, by the way, it's five years ago this week that Microsoft announced the end of life for small business server. Um, it was a, uh, a, a bizarre announcement from uh, David Fabricius, um, Fabricius on the team. And uh, came out like right before the 4th of July, Carl. I don't know if you remember. You know, they say in Washington, D.C., always release bad news on Friday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and there, 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 there was a little bit of that. So it's five years ago. We have a really active debate uh, conversation going on right now up on Facebook. Uh, an SBS group called You Know You Grew Up with SBS right. If. So if you want to go find that, there's a bunch of posts flying back and forth about five years, you know, blah, 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 and um, welcome your participation in that. The other thing, Carl, uh, while we're waiting for any questions, uh, David, I'm going to get to yours, is that I'm wearing a T-shirt for the New Orleans SBS Migration IT Pro Conference that ah. says 2007, 2007. I look down and I'm like, well, wait a minute. The simple math is that was 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> what a great conference. Yeah, what a – boy, howdy. The years go quick. Uh, David Anderson asks, uh, please show the recommended book slide again. It uh, went off in a flash. So, Carl, there we go. I think he's asking about the resource slide. Yeah. Folks, last call for your questions. Um, don't forget, uh, up in the chat window, and Jenny's going to get you a link, it's Double Dip Week, so we have a disaster recovery webinar tomorrow. Um, well, I'll be at Inspire in Washington, D.C., uh, July 9th through 13th, and then ChannelCon August 31st through July, uh, August 30, July 31st through <laughs> August 2nd in Austin. Um, so we look forward to seeing you live and in person. And I think, uh, I think that's going to cover off other than a final thank you to our sponsors with um, Cynix and Veeam. And we truly, truly, truly appreciate your support. And Carl, why don't you take us out with the last word? What's the next city you're in on your tour, Carl? So on my tour, which is at smbroadshow.com, where we're going to Chicago 
and it's July 25th, and then I'm going to Detroit the 27th. So I'm going to hang out in Chicago uh, during this cool weather. You notice I'm not in Chicago in January. This is the advantage of I pick the cities and then I pick the months. So <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd take July. My wife's from Chicago. Wait a minute. I better watch. There's a bad joke about Detroit and mothers. So, um, but I'll tell you, dude, I've sweated coming out of that airport. Boy, howdy, Chicago in July. God bless well, you, man. Yeah, well, we're going to be inside in the air conditioning, so that's a beautiful thing. But there will be no snow. There will be no snow up to your eyeballs. There will be no snow. So. There we go. Okay, so we have uh, thank yous from uh, John Cricky, see me in Austin. Wayne says thank you. Uh, Amin, Amin says thank you. So with that, uh, we're at time, Carl. So we're gonna we're gonna call it good for this six part series. We'll see you next fall with another six part series, all new lectures. Thank you for attending the MSP Tech Talk. is a great series. Have a great day, and in the USA, enjoy the 4th of July week coming up. Back to the salt mines. Have a great day, everybody. All right. Thanks for having me. So long. <laughs>